Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about the Bayer Villager oxidation reaction. But before we get into that, let's go through the problems I assigned last lecture. So in the first problem, I ask you to show what products would be obtained using the following three sets of conditions. So let's start with the first one. If we treat an alkene with MCPBA, we will get an epoxide. Now the one thing worth noting is that you could also potentially have a Bayer Villager uh, reaction especially because these are tertiary and benzylic positions. This might be a faster Bayer Villager than you'll typically uh, see, but we're gonna understand why that's the case later today. In the next reaction via ozonolysis, we would get cleavage of this carbon-carbon double bond and we would get this dialdehyde as our product. Finally, using osmium tetroxide via the Upjohn oxidation reaction, we would get conversion of this double bond into this 1,2-cis-syndiol. Uh, this and its enantiomer would both be formed. Because I haven't uh, illustrated stereochemistry on the two alpha positions of the carbonyl, it's not clear whether this is a single compound or a mixture of diastereomers, but the point being is that both hydroxy groups would be installed from the same side. The next problem I assigned is propose a series of steps to get from the compound on the left to the compound on the right. And while the solution that I'm gonna draw here might be different than what you come up with, this is just one potential solution. If you have a really good solution that you came up with yourself, I'd encourage you to write out what you did in the, in the comments and I'd be happy to see it. And if it's really good, I'll pin it. So what I would do is I would first take osmium tetroxide and this is typically gonna react with the most electron rich alkene, uh, which should be the one that does not have an electron withdrawing group. Now, if you left this for long enough, eventually the other alkene would react, but if we're doing careful control, monitoring the reaction by TLC or some other form of analysis, we should be able to see which alkene is going first. And so with that, uh, if you didn't want to do that, you could do ozonolysis, which would almost certainly react here first. Uh, once we have this aldehyde isolated, which for ozonolysis would be formed upon workup, in our case, the osmium tetroxide would form a 1,2-diol and the sodium pyridate cleaves it to the aldehyde. Um, but once we have this aldehyde, we could do a pinic oxidation using sodium chloride in the presence of a weak acid, and that would afford us with this carboxylic acid. Finally, what we could do is treat it with basic hydrogen peroxide, and that would do the 1,2 addition to this position. Now, what you might have considered is doing the hydrogen peroxide sodium hydroxide step first. However, I would be concerned that if you had an epoxide present, that it might actually react with the sodium pyridate and it might cleave the same way that a 1,2-diol does. Because I know based on anecdotal experience that having an epoxide could be problematic in the presence of sodium pyridate. Um, but it could be that for this compound that this would work. But I would say that the following sequence is likely the most robust one. But if you have a better one, please comment down below and I'd like to hear it. And so with that, let's get to today's material, the Bayer-Villager oxidation. So the Bayer-Villager oxidation reaction is one where you take a ketone or an aldehyde and it's converted to an ester, or in the case of some aldehydes, a carboxylic acid. Now there's some very important considerations because a lot of the time when you see these reactions, it's not explained that this is actually a very predictable reaction and you can usually predict the outcome of the reaction and you'll only get one product most of the time. Now there's also enzymes that do these reactions and enzymes can be more selective. Sometimes they're less selective depending. Um, but most of the time, these are just done with MCPBA, which is the per acid of choice most times. So in general, if you're doing a Bayer Villager oxidation, these reactions tend to be slower than epoxidation reactions. Now, this isn't always the case, and sometimes there's conditions where you can favor epoxidation or Bayer Villager, but I wouldn't say that those are generalizable enough that you could say, like, these conditions will only give you epoxides and these conditions will only give you Bayer Villager oxidation, because substrates and conditions vary from case to case. Um, so some considerations. These reactions will be faster if you have a really electron-rich migrating group. So this could be like an ether that's adjacent, or a nitrogen-containing compound that's adjacent, or a benzylic position, or a benzene ring. So in these cases, instead of taking quite a long time, these will be faster reactions. Now, this is the most important thing to pay attention to from this entire presentation, okay? So when you're looking at a Bayer-Villager oxidation, hydrides will move more easily than tertiary positions, which will move more easily then cyclohexyl positions, which will move more easily, then secondary positions, which will move more easily than benzylic positions, which will move more easily than benzene or arenes or heteroarenes, that kind of thing, um, which will move more easily than primary positions, which will move more easily than methyl positions. So in this case, the ease of moving would be the R prime group, where the ester group would be migrated more easily. So if you take a terminal aldehyde, that's an alkyl aldehyde, an aliphatic aldehyde, this should be converted to a carboxylic acid. However, 
if you have a benzaldehyde, specifically this just applies in the case of benzaldehydes, instead of having the hydride shift to the oxygen, the benzene ring will shift to the ester. And I'll show you some examples of that uh, as we look through actual examples of this reaction. And so this is really important to study. For the most part, it links with uh, carbocation stability. So you can imagine an H plus ion is more stable than a tertiary carbocation, which is more stable than the secondary, which is more stable than a benzylic, which is more stable than a primary, etc. And this is one type of a one, two shift reaction. And you'll see why it's a one, two shift in a minute. So the mechanism of this reaction is as follows. A protonated or an unprotonated uh, per acid is able to attack at a ketone. Usually a ketone could be an aldehyde. What can then happen is when the alkoxide collapses back down, instead of this MCPVA just being kicked back off, one of the R groups can shift its electron density onto the adjacent oxygen. Now this is a really weird reaction because we see a carbon-carbon bond being cleaved and the carbon is instead forming a bond to this oxygen and eliminating uh, this 3-chlorobenzoate as a leaving group. Sometimes changing the per acid will change the outcome, so sometimes um, using like acetic acid peroxide uh, would give you different outcome than performic acid. So per acetic acid, performic acid, trifluoromethyl performic acid or per acetic acid could have different outcomes. So sometimes if you're getting a mixture of compounds, you can try changing your per acid and that could improve things. Now it's weird because I'm saying the stability of this R prime group as a carbocation is what leads to its selectivity. However, this isn't a carbocation really, right? It's, it's something with an electron pair as well as there's an adjacent negatively charged group. And so if you're wondering why this is the case, there's a really good description in Clayton in this physical organic chemistry textbook that I didn't want to include because it's quite a useful figure and you should go read the book yourself. And I've provided a link to that textbook down below uh, in, the, in the description. Uh, not one that you can download, but if you're witty, you can figure it out on your own. Okay, so in general, this is how the reaction is going to occur. If we're doing a Bayer Villager, this is not considering the possibility of epoxidation reactions. This is only one to addition to carbonyls. Okay, so in this first example, if you recall from the migratory aptitude, a methyl group is like the least likely to shift. Um, and so because this benzene ring has a higher uh, likelihood to shift, we get the oxygen forming a bond to the benzene ring rather than to the methyl. However, if we take this other case where I explicitly highlighted that if you have an aldehyde and it's a benzaldehyde, the benzene ring will shift. Here you can see the formation of a formate ester. So instead of forming an OH, we form an O-benzene. In this next case, uh, we have a benzylic or a heterobenzylic position uh, versus a secondary position. And uh, because this secondary position isn't very like stable of a carbocation, the benzylic position instead forms the carbon-oxygen bond. In this next case, we have a derivative of something which looks somewhat like morphine or some sort of um, antagonist, so people aren't overdosing. And what they do is they are able to shift this tertiary position over the secondary position, or this quaternary position, rather. And so this alkoxy group leads to additional carbocation stability in that position. Additionally, it's more substituted. It's kind of hard to see there, but there's a quaternary bond into the plane of the page. Okay, so more substituted position reacts more. Additionally, this alkoxy group makes this a faster reaction. So I didn't really highlight here, but these are relatively fast reactions because they're adjacent to a benzene ring. In this case, it's uh, heterobenzylic, and in this case, it's because there's an alkoxy group stabilizing that position. Now, in the next case, here we have a position that isn't particularly activated. It takes 12 hours in uh, chloroform. They also buffer the reaction using a phosphate buffer. And you can see that this tertiary position is more reactive than the secondary position. So again, only one product is obtained. Now in this next case, there's no stabilizing factors whatsoever. And so this is a really long reaction, 216 hours. They also have to use a different solvent. And so here, because this second, this tertiary position is more reactive than the methyl, the methyl group does not shift. So in this case, we're able to form an ester to that position. Okay. So hopefully from these trends, uh, you can clearly see that the reactivity migratory aptitude is well established. And if you don't believe me, you can look on Reaxis or SciFinder, and there's thousands of reactions to look at where you'll see these same trends. Now, I haven't picked examples where we have two secondary positions or two tertiary positions, because those can be you know competitive. Um, but in these cases, if you have different substituents adjacent to your carbonyl, you'll usually get really good selectivity for one product. If you don't, you could try changing your per acid, and you'll usually get really predictable reaction outcomes. 
And so some good practice for this would be show the product of the following reactions. We take this benzaldehyde, treat it with MCPBA. What's the structure of the product? In this next case, we have this aliphatic aldehyde. And while I uh, verbally said what these types of reactions will do, I'd like you to see if you can propose what would happen. In this final case, we have this ketone. And so draw the product of this reaction. And so with that, I hope this has been a useful video about the Bayer Villager oxidation reaction. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And I hope you have a great day. Like and subscribe if you'd like. See ya.